Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, everybody else. All right, so come on in. Those of you who are still coming, find your seats. Um, and let's just begin with a word of prayer, and then we'll jump right into the subject matter. Father in heaven, Lord, we, we ask right now that you would please come into our presence. May your Holy Spirit guide our minds. Father, help us to think and to feel uh, in ways that are beautiful. Lord, we want to know you, but we also want to serve you more intelligently and more passionately. So thank you that we have this chance to, to spend time together. In Jesus' name, amen. By the way, I think that uh, Valencia is evidence of global warming. <laughs> is it not horribly hot here, or is that just me? What time is it right now? Somebody tell me what time it is. And I have already taken three showers. I'm not even done with the day yet. It is so hot here. Um, secondly, when I'm done with the presentation, this has nothing to do with the message as well. If anybody knows anywhere good to eat, I have not eaten anything significant since yesterday because I can't find anything to eat. The, the, hotel, the, the hotel where I'm staying has a restaurant, but it's closed. I said, well, how long is it closed? They said it's closed the whole week. So there's nothing to eat. All I have is chocolate and more chocolate and more chocolate in my bag. And I'm getting tired of eating chocolate if that is something you can imagine. It's very difficult to imagine that, but I'm tired of eating chocolate. So if you know some more good to eat, please, please let me know, okay? All right, well, I want to spend this time together, first of all, uh, talking about food a little bit, since food is a favorite subject of ours, okay? I have to tell you a little bit about myself. My wife and my two daughters, they have leveled an accusation against me. It's not very pleasant. They say that I am very strange, that I am very weird for a guy. And the reason they say this is simply because I like shopping. I love it. I love shopping. And they tell me that, that it's not right for a guy, for a man, to like shopping. They say that this is a female love and that guys usually, all of the friends they have, everybody else they know, their husbands and fathers stay in the car while the women go shopping or they sit on the bench waiting for them to get done. But I like to go with them everywhere they go shopping and to help them pick out all of their clothing and their shoes and, and everything. And, uh, and, and they tell me that this is very strange. So I'm just wondering, are there any other guys here that you like shopping? You are a man and you enjoy shopping, anybody? Just three, one, two, three, that's it. Okay, how many females like shopping? Every female in the place, just about, okay? So, so, so there's, a, there's something else you need to know about this problem that I have, this, if it's a problem. I don't know that it's a problem, but something else you need to know. My favorite place to shop is the grocery store. Oh, because I like eating so much. Eating is so fun, isn't it? And I love shopping at the grocery store in order to find very good new things to eat. Now, my wife, my wife, she thinks it's weird that I like to go to the grocery store, but I think it's because she is jealous because I think she knows, she will not admit this, she knows that my shopping method is superior to hers. I am just a better shopper than she is in every way. I'll tell you why. Because every time I go to the grocery store, I have a method. I walk in and I go all the way to the right, to the far aisle, and I walk up and down every single aisle twice. Because there are two sides, right? You have to see everything. If you don't see everything, you're not going to find anything new, right? My wife, her method of shopping is so lame. She just walks in the store and she jumps around to two or three places and gets the things that she wants and leaves. It's a very short event, very boring. This is her method. So she doesn't like me to go shopping with her. Sometimes if I'm in the house, 
I may be sitting there in a chair or something or on a sofa reading, and I'll see her out of my peripheral vision trying to leave the house without me knowing. And I'll turn to her and I'll say, are you going to the grocery store? And she'll say, please don't go with me. Don't go with me. Please don't go. It takes so long when you go. I say, sweetie, we need to bond together. Shopping is a bonding activity. Please let me go with you. Please let me go. She says, no, please don't go. I'm in a hurry. I just need to get a few things. But I insist that I must go with her to the grocery store. And so she tells me, if you're going to go with me, you have to take your own car. So we drive with two cars to the grocery store. And then she says, when we get to the store, you have to have your own cart, your own basket. It's very strange. It seems to me that it's even disloyal. I think that we should shop together for bonding. Well, on this one occasion, she was making a very good Mexican dinner. Here in Spain, you don't know what that is, do you? Do you know? Raise your hand if you know what a Mexican dinner is. Very few people. Well, she was making some really good food, and she said, I need you to go to the store and be very fast. Do not go up and down every aisle. Just go and get some salsa. Do you have salsa? When I say salsa, what does that mean to you? It means tomatoes, that's it? Okay, well, well, well salsa, where I'm from, is tomatoes and cilantro and garlic and lemon juice. It's so good, it's so good. And there is medium, but also mild and very hot. So she said, you need to go to the store and you need to get some salsa. And I said, okay, I can do it. She said, please hurry, I just need to, you just need to hurry, go, go, go. So I jumped in the car and I go to the store. I walk into the grocery store and I go directly to the salsa aisle. I have resisted now the temptation to go all the way to the first aisle and go every, because I'm in a hurry and I need to prove to my wife that I can shop like a man. So I go straight to the salsa aisle, but I have a problem because there's a woman standing right in front of all the salsa selection. And she is spending a lot of time there, just looking at all the options. So I'm thinking, what am I to do? I'm in a hurry, I need to get some salsa. But I don't want to be rude, right? You can't just, you can't just push the woman out of the way and get your salsa. You can't go in front of her, you have to wait your turn. So I come behind her and I just stand there waiting my turn. Just stand there waiting, looking over her shoulder, waiting for my turn. And suddenly, out of nowhere, something very strange happened. This woman, who's looking forward, she reaches back her hand and tenderly clasps mine in hers. And we're standing there, holding hands, in the grocery store, in front of the salsa. And as we're looking forward, I'm wondering, why is she doing this? And I'm trying to sort it out, and I'm very nervous. I have a problem. When I get nervous, I grip more tightly. <laughs> it's just a nervous habit. I don't know why. So as we're standing there, and she's looking forward, and I'm looking forward, and we're holding hands, she says to me, she says to me in a kind of romantic, breathy tone, she says, medium or hot, sweetie pie? I couldn't believe it. I don't even know her. So I'm thinking she must be confused. This must be a case of mistaken, what? Identity, for sure. But this is happening very fast. This didn't take as long as I'm explaining it to you. It happened like in a matter of seconds. I walk, I stand, she takes my hand, medium or hot, sweetie pie, and then she is turning toward me with her lips puckering. She is about to kiss me in the salsa aisle as we're holding hands. So I don't know what to do because I'm thinking on the one hand, I know that I am not sweetie pie. He is somewhere in the grocery store shopping, obviously. On the other hand, 
she did ask my opinion about salsa. <laughs> and I have very specific, definite opinions about salsa. So I think I need to help her. I need to help her with her salsa selection. So as we stand there holding hands, and her head is turning toward me, and she is about to kiss me, I do what any self-respecting Seventh-day Adventist husband would do. I back up, and I pull my lips in. <laughs> as we're holding hands. And I'm leaning back and gripping a little tighter, <laughs> because I'm so nervous. And as she is turning toward me, I am about to explain, actually, ma'am, I prefer mild salsa, so you can taste all of the subtle fusion of the ingredients coming together. It's so good. You must mild. And that's the one I rec... Just as I'm trying to explain all of this, our eyes meet. And she screams and throws my hand from hers and runs out of the salsa aisle. She didn't even take any salsa after all that time <laughs> that she spent looking. So, so where did she go? Where did she go? Where did she go? She went to find who? Sweetie Pie. She went to find her true love because she realized that there was an imposter in the salsa aisle. Now, the only reason I share this story with you is so that you will never forget what we're about to discover. I believe that the subject matter is so important that I want you to remember it. As the title says, how to change everything about your life for the better. The concept that we're about to unpack, in my opinion, is the absolute most important thing that a human being can learn. There's nothing more significant that a human being can discover. This is the crucial discovery of life. There's nothing, nothing, nothing better. Because we're basically asking the question, it's a very simple question, but the answer is super important. It's a very simple question. What is a human being? Now, here are the nuance in the question. I'm not asking, who are you? Who am I? You are a who, but you are also a what. As a who, my name is Ty Gibson. I live in the state of Oregon, and I have a family history, and, and I have all kinds of experiences. I could tell you about me and my particular life's experience. I could tell you who I am, but I don't want to talk about who I am or who you are. I want to talk about what you are, what I am. What is a human being? Or let me ask the question a little bit more specifically. What is the fundamental fuel, the fundamental power that fuels human flourishing and thriving? I mean, come on. Everybody here, without exception, you want to thrive in life, right? You want to flourish. You want for your life to, to, to open like a flower opens to the sun, right? You want to experience life at its best. Sometimes we call this the pursuit of happiness. We're going to talk about that in just a moment. But in our particular world right now, in our culture, and I don't know exactly where all of you are from. I'm told that there are 40 different countries represented here. But everything is becoming, the world is becoming very flat socially. And, and my guess is that your culture is my culture, my culture is your culture. It's all pretty much the same for most of us now. And everybody is pursuing the same thing. Everybody's pursuing the same thing. Now, I want to introduce you, first of all, to the scientific research of Dr. Dean Ornish. Raise your hand if you've ever heard of Dr. Dean Ornish. Anybody? Dr. Dean Ornish. Okay, very few of you, two of you, I think, are familiar with, that's fine. He's not somebody you even would know about, although Dr. Dean Ornish is famous in medical circles because he is the doctor who discovered that you can reverse heart disease with exercise and good diet. So that is his claim to fame. That's why people know about him in the scientific community. That's his, what made him popular and famous. But Dr. Dean Ornish 
had a very specific interest, not in heart disease per se, the physical heart, but he had also an interest in another body of research, and he wrote this book, Love and Survival. Now just think about the comparison of those two words. What does a medical scientist have to do with studying love and survival? Can you see the subtitle? Is it clear? The subtitle is The Scientific Basis for the Healing Power of Intimacy. So Dr. Ornish, for 20 years, did a bunch of research and a bunch of controlled studies, and this is what he discovered, okay? Listen to what he says. He says, anything that promotes feelings, notice the language carefully, anything that promotes what? Feelings, emotions. Anything that promotes feelings of love and intimacy is what? Say that word out loud. Healing. Now, he means biologically, physically healing. So he has seen in his scientific research a connection between feelings and biology, emotions and biological health. And he says very clearly that anything that promotes feelings of intimacy is healing, and then, by contrast, watch this, this is amazing. Anything that promotes isolation, separation, loneliness, loss, hostility, anger, cynicism, depression, alienation, and related, here it is again, feelings. Those kinds of feelings often leads to suffering, disease, and premature death from how many causes? All causes. Now he's a medical doctor, and when he uses this language, premature death from all causes, he is specifically referring to the fact that all of us have what are called genetic predispositions. So if you go to a doctor for the first time, you've never been to this particular doctor before, what is the first question the doctor will ask? What is it? How do you feel? Yeah, maybe. But do you, feel, do you feel out the paperwork? Family history, that's right. What about your mom? What about your dad? What about your grandmother, your grandfather? What about your aunties and uncles? Why does the doctor want a family history? Because we all have genetic predispositions. So every one of you, everyone here this morning, this afternoon, every one of you are genetically predisposed to certain diseases that you are more likely to die from than other ones. Everybody is genetically predisposed to something. And Dr. Ornish is saying something very remarkable. He's saying, now watch this, he's saying if you live in relationships that are positive, relationships in which you have good feelings, you will less likely succumb or yield to your genetic predispositions. On the other hand, if you live in a social environment where there's hostility or anger, if you live in a home, in a marriage, in a local community, in a work environment, if you live in any social environment where there are negative emotions, those negative emotions will have a bad impact on your biology. So, so, so right now, we all know, don't we, from all the science and everything in the news, we all know that exercise and nutrition are important for health. Do we know this or not? We know this. But here is what science is revealing to us now. Now, I'm not, I'm not suggesting this um, as something I recommend. I'm simply telling you that science is now showing that if you have a poor diet and you get very little exercise, but you live in a very positive social environment around people who love you and care for you, and you have a lot of positive emotional experiences, right? You have poor diet, poor exercise, but you have good feelings all the time. You are happy, happy, happy. 
You are better off than if you get lots of exercise. You're on the treadmill running. You eat nothing but spinach and kale, maybe some beans. You have a good diet and good exercise, but you have negative relationships. There's anger. There's resentment. There's negative emotions. But you have all the other things. Are good exercise, good diet. You are in worse condition for having great health than the person who gets very little exercise, bad diet, but they have good relationships. What this is telling us is that our emotional state of being is the most significant factor in health. Now, I'm not suggesting that you stop exercising and you eat crap and then you have good relationships. I'm suggesting that you have all three factors in place, right? Exercise, good nutrition, and what? Positive relationships. Now watch what Don, Dr. Dean Ornish goes on to say. He says the scientific evidence, the scientific evidence leaves little doubt that love and intimacy are powerful determinants of our health and survival. Why they have such an impact remains somewhat a mystery. Now, the reason this is a mystery to Dr. Ornish is because Dr. Ornish is an atheist. He's doing all of this research, and he's discovering that human beings are wired psychologically and emotionally and even biologically for love and intimacy, but it's a mystery to him. Why is it a mystery to him? Because he subscribes to the naturalistic worldview that says that human beings are merely survival animals and that the highest law of human existence is the law of self-preservation. So all of this research that he is doing is revealing facts that do not match up with his worldview. Now we're going to go a step further Dr. Ornish went around the world after he had done all this research, made all these discoveries. He went around the world and he asked 26 experts, some of the most intelligent people in the world, in various different fields of science and medicine. And he asked 26 people one question. Why are human beings so dependent on love for their well-being and their health. All 26 experts around the world, do you know what the answer is that they gave? We don't know why. All of them basically said we shouldn't be like this. Selfishness should be the highest law that determines health and survival, not love. We don't know why. Well, let's go a step further. Dr. Ornish tells a story in his book that is extremely important. And in his research and the research of a lot of others, there is what we're going to call the malfunction region and then there is the optimization region. Do you know, I don't know exactly if all of my vocabulary is coming through or not because of the language barrier. Um, malfunction is what? What is it? It's not operating properly, right? Something that is going wrong, right? What is optimization? Yeah, it's, it's functioning at its best, okay? So here's what the scientific, now this is, we're not even talking about the Bible or theology or anything, this is just science, okay? On this side, human beings begin to break down and to malfunction biologically, where they experience things like racism and loneliness and isolation and envy and greed and hate and anger. All of those things have something in common. Do you know what they all have in common? All of them are self-centeredness in some form or another. The optimization region Generosity, acceptance, kindness, forgiveness, loyalty, 
faithfulness, those kinds of things produce the optimal state for thriving and flourishing as a human being, even on a biological level. The studies that Dr. Ornish and others have done are even revealing, for example, let me give an example of one, one study that has been done. If you, the top one on the optimization side, generosity. If you have a lot of money and a lot of material goods, you're doing very well and, 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 and you have a lot of things, science is proving to us that if I have a lot of money, watch this, if I just take some of my money and give it away to others who don't have things, my immune system will automatically strengthen. My white blood cell count will go up. Generosity produces a state of optimization in the whole person as a human being. Are you tracking with me? Okay, so let's go a step further. What do all of these things have in common? They're other-centered. Focus, I'm focused on the other. You're focused on the other. And to the degree that a human being moves from those kinds of behaviors on the left to the other kinds of behaviors on the right, that individual will begin to reverse whatever disease trends are going on in the body. These are words from a historian. The historian is an Italian historian named Salambini, and he is commenting on something that happened where the Roman emperor back in the 12th century conducted a diabolical experiment. And the experiment that he conducted is he wanted to know what language children would grow up to speak if never spoken to. If you raise children in silence, what is the natural language? He thought it would be German because that was his language. So he thought, oh, German is the best language. If children are raised in silence, they will all grow up to speak German naturally. He was an idiot. Okay, so he conducted an experiment. He took babies from their mothers at birth. And then he had nurses who raised the babies in silence, never speaking in their presence. But he had a second rule. Rule number one, do not speak in their presence. Rule number two, never touch the babies. Do not touch them. No skin on skin touch. So he had tools that were made for changing and feeding and bathing, but there was to be no touch. And the historian reported that all of the children in the experiment died because they could not live without petting or affectionate touch. This is remarkable. Recent research has demonstrated that if you have premature babies that are born, that if you put some of the premature babies in the traditional treatment models, you put them in an incubator, and you hook them up to an IV to get nutrition, and you protect them from all the germs by keeping them in an enclosed environment, okay? And then if you take some of the other babies, also born premature, and you put them also in the same environment, but you only change one thing. A few times each day, the nurses put their hands on the little baby's bodies and touch their feet and their hands and rub their heads and pinch their little noses and rub their tummies. And that's all. No difference. Two groups of babies, all of them born premature. And all they did different was to affectionately touch the one group of babies. And their survival rate became extremely high. And they gained body weight more rapidly. And the only difference was is that they were touched that they were affectionately cared for in that manner. What science is discovering right now 
is that mentally and emotionally, each one of us is engineered for a state of what I'm going to call being without being. In other words, I exist for you. You exist for me. And any relationship in which selfishness in the form of anger, in the form of any kind of negative words that are spoken, any human being who lives in a relationship in which I know that in the relationship your primary focus is on me and my well-being and you know in the relationship that my focus is on your well-being and happiness, that is the optimal state of being for humans without exception. So the question becomes, why are we like this? I want to share with you three scriptures, three powerful scriptures in succession. These are so simple, but when you see them lined up with one another, it will make total sense. Number one, the Bible says God is what? God is love. What does this word love mean? It means other-centered, self-giving, right? Focused outward rather than focused inward. God exists for others, not for himself. God is love. Now watch this. God is love, 1 John 4, 16. And the Bible says God created mankind in his own what? In his own image. What is God again? God is love. When God created human beings, he created human beings in his image. What is his image? Love. God created human beings psychologically, emotionally, and even physically, biologically. You and I were created engineered, designed for love. And we thrive best in relationships where there is love. Now, I said three scriptures, right? Number one, God is love. Number two, God created mankind in his own image. And then, Proverbs 19.22, what a person desires is unfailing love. What this scripture is describing is the universal longing. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what country. Everybody longs for precisely the same thing, a certain quality of love, an unfailing love. Let me demonstrate this to you. Let me demonstrate this to you. Anywhere you go in the world, doesn't matter what country, what culture, you receive the same answer to this one question, okay? What is of greatest value in life? What is the most important? For example, if I have a billion dollars, that's a lot of money, and I say to you, I'm going to give this money to you. It's yours. You can have it. One billion dollars, that's a lot of money. Do you want it? Of course you want it. Don't lie. You want it. One billion dollars and it's yours, you can have it. And everybody says, yes, yes, I'll take it. Thank you, please. But then I say there's just one condition. One billion dollars, it's yours. But you can never see or speak to or have any contact with the five most important people in your life ever again. Your sister, your brother, your mother, maybe your brother's fine, you can let him go. Okay, your sister, your mother, your father, your husband, your wife, your child. If someone offered you right now a billion dollars, but you could never, ever have contact with the five people you love the most, how many of you would still accept the money and the deal? Just very few materialistic teenage boys. That's it. Not one girl would accept the money. Not one female. 
And most guys, if they just think about it, a few more minutes. But guys mature more slowly than girls. So it takes a little bit of thought. You have to, oh, I don't know. Maybe, maybe. I like my mom, but... Okay? I have two daughters and one son. If somebody said to me, Ty, I will give you all the money you could possibly desire, but you can never speak to your daughters again. You could never see your son again. I would just say, no, thank you. And I think the same is true of you. And it doesn't matter where you go in the world, everybody answers the question the same way. Why? Because we know that there's one thing that matters more than everything. And what is that one thing that matters more than everything? It is love. It is relationships that are positive and flourishing. We know this because every human being is described in this, in this text. God is love. God made mankind in his image. And now all of us are longing for the same thing. Every one of us wants the same thing. It doesn't matter who you are. Every person in the world is running up and down the aisles of the grocery store looking for sweetie pie. Everybody. Everybody's looking for true love. And this is why we go through one relationship after another, one broken relationship after another, looking for love in all the wrong places. So what I'm suggesting to you is a very simple but powerful idea, that if you will receive it, if you will believe it, you, everything will change for you. Everything will change for you. The secret to human thriving is to love and be loved. That's it. I came all the way from the United States to tell you that. This is the number one most vital secret to human thriving, without exception. And once you understand this, all everything in your life comes into order and your priorities become straight. I'm sure you've heard this before. There's no man, no woman, who on their deathbed, right before they're about to die, they say, oh, I just wish that I would have spent more time at work, at the office, on the job. Oh, I wish I would have made more money when you're dying. Oh, I wish I would have spent more time buying things for me. I wish I would have had a nicer car. I wish I would have had a better house. Nobody. On their deathbed, everybody is saying the same thing. I wish I would have resolved the conflict between me and my daughter. I wish that me and my sister would have been able to spend more time together. I wish that I would have been faithful to my marriage vows. I wish that I had spent more time with my best friend from high school and called him more often. I wish I would have been there for my grandmother in the last few years of her life to let her know that I loved her. I wish, I wish, I wish. Nobody comes to the end of their life and wishes they would have made more money or lived in a better house or had a nicer car. Once you understand this, all of your priorities get straight. You'd be way better off making less money and having better relationships. You'd be way better off settling for a smaller house and more time with your children. You'd be way better off not pursuing a profession and a career that will consume every moment of your day and pause and take a deep breath and say, you know what? I'm going to be content to have a job that makes less money so I can spend more time doing adventurous, wonderful things with my friends and family. What I'm telling you is that experiences matter more than material things. What I'm telling you is that people are the most vital thing in life. 
I don't know who those people are for you. You know who they are. I can tell you, in my own experience, that as I receive my paychecks and I accumulate my money on a monthly basis, there was a time when I thought, you know, I'm going to save that money. I'm going to save that money. I'm going to save that money, and I'm going to buy for me a brand new Toyota Tundra. Some of you aren't impressed. You, 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 don't, you don't have the fondness for Toyota trucks that I have. Because the present truck that I have has 250,000 miles on it. It is from 1997, and it is leaking at least three different liquids. I don't even know what it is leaking. So I'm saving money, saving money, saving money so I can buy a new truck. And then something dawned on me one day. This dawned on me. I said, you know what? This truck is fine. I'm going to use that money to make more trips to visit my daughters who live 3,000 miles away. So that's what I spend my money on. I spend my money on my daughters, not a stupid truck. And I'm going to be way happier building the ongoing relationship with my daughters than to simply have a nicer, more shiny, beautiful car. I'm just using that as a simple example. I don't know what the example is for you. What I'm telling you today is that love is the essence of God's identity. And God made you to love like he loves. And that love is what you long for more than anything else. If you could just wrap your mind around it, if you could just get your priorities straight. It's not profession, it's not education, it's not cars, houses, lands, it's not money, it's not stuff. What you really, really, really long for is to love and be loved in healthy, thriving, beautiful relationships. So you have to prioritize. You have to think to yourself and you have to make deliberate decisions. I'm going to live for people. I'm going to live for my sister, my brother, my mom, my dad, my husband, my wife. In some of your cases, my boyfriend. But he's not going to last very long, so. You are not merely a bipedal survival machine bent on consumption and reproduction. That's the popular perspective on human beings. That's what, that's what materialistic science is telling us. You exist to consume products and to have babies. Now, there's nothing wrong with consuming a few products, especially good salsa. There's nothing wrong with procreating, getting married and having children. I'm all for it. But that's not an end in itself. You're not merely an evolving animal. So what are you as a human being? You are a majestic creature of the divine image made for receiving and giving love as of the highest order. That's what you are. We began this time together by me saying, hey, I want to talk to you about what you are. So what are you? What is a human being? You are a psychological, emotional, biological love machine. You are made for positive relationships. So pursue them. Pursue relationships with people. Spend your energy, your time, your money pursuing relationships with people. Serving the needs of people who don't have what you have. Give your life to others. And happiness will come in through the back door and through the windows and down through the chimney. Happiness is one of those things that if you pursue it, it will constantly elude you, like a mirage in the desert. 
But happiness is a byproduct of love. If you feel valued and loved, and you love and value others, if you're living to meet the needs of others, I guarantee you, you will be happy. You will be happy. You will be happy. Neil Prashriska, I think is how you say his name, maybe, wrote a book recently that I would highly recommend, but if you don't have time to read it, I'll tell you what it says in two minutes. Okay? This book is called The Happiness Equation, and in this book, <laughs> this thing went straight to the New York Times bestselling list. It's being translated into languages all over the world because of the simple thing that this guy is saying. Well, he says that the happiness equation that everybody is assuming is true is that great work produces big success, which then produces happiness. Our whole world, get an education so you can get a profession, so you can get stuff, so you can be happy. So people are constantly pursuing this, this, particular, this particular pattern. Great work, big success, ah, happiness. But Neil comes along and he says, that's not how it works at all. That's actually not how it works. Here's how it works. Be happy to begin with, then happiness will produce great work and big success. So, so he's completely flipping the equation in the opposite direction. He's saying you don't get happiness as a result of your work and material gain. Happiness is the starting point. You begin with happiness. It's this simple. Right now, this moment, no matter what you have, and you're all very young, you're probably all very poor, unless you have parents that have money, and they're getting tired of you. <laughs> they want you to make it on your own. So most of you don't have a whole lot, most likely. But here's how simple it is. What I'm telling you is that you can be happy right now. In an instant, by simply rearranging your perspective on reality. Happiness is not something you acquire through your work, your profession. If your value is attached to your work and your success, you will never be happy because there will always be somebody better than you. There will always be somebody better than you. And we live in a culture right now that is being talked about a lot as a kind of very negative culture of eros. We live in a very erotic culture that is right now defining people's value, especially female value, on the premise of appearance. And the media is projecting to women and to men what the perfect woman looks like. The problem is, is they're all photoshopped and they don't actually look like that. It, it, it's a complete lie. And we have been programmed to believe that that's what you need to look like. And so there's no happiness because there's always a sense that I'm not measuring up. If my, if my hair is straight, I want it curly. If it's curly, I want it straight. If it's brown, I want it blonde. If it's blonde, I want it brown. I'm too fat, I'm too skinny. I'm too tall, I'm too short. My lips aren't plump enough, so get some injections. My boobs aren't big enough, we can fix that. Even now, where I'm from in the United States, the number one gift for graduating females from high school that they want from their parents, it used to be a car. Graduate from high school, mom and dad, I want a car. No, now it's a boob job. Number one gift for high school graduates. Our culture is communicating that your value is determined by your appearance. The problem is that there's always going to be somebody 
that intimidates you because you're going to imagine that they look better than you. There's always going to be some magazine cover that's going to communicate to you that you're not good enough. It is a deadly cycle that has the emphasis in entirely the wrong direction. As believers in Christ, as followers of Jesus, we need to completely reject that definition of beauty and success. We need to push back on it, and we need to take on board an entirely different orientation. We need to have a different belief system. And our belief system needs to be something like this. We begin with happiness. We don't get happiness by looking perfect or by getting the perfect job or getting the perfect car or getting the perfect house. We don't, we don't achieve happiness. We already have value on an infinite scale by virtue of the fact that we are sons and daughters of God created in his image with the capacity for loving like he loves. So we don't need to let the world define for us. In his book, Neil gives this illustration. And he essentially says that happiness is the byproduct of love. It's so simple, isn't it? It's so simple. Happiness is the byproduct of love. It's the byproduct of living for others. It is the result. This is the vital missing piece. This is the thing behind the thing, behind the thing, behind the thing. This is the bottom line. This is the core. This is the vital missing piece. This is, this is the true life's experience that you're looking for that I'm looking for. This is sweetie pie in the grocery store. And everything else that this world is parading before us is the imposter standing there gripping our hand a little tighter and a little tighter and a little tighter. The world is miscommunicating to us. I love the way C.S. Lewis summarizes. God cannot give us a happiness and a peace apart from himself because it is not there. It doesn't exist. It's like saying, it's like saying, I want a car without tires. Well, you have a chunk of metal, but you don't have a car. I want an airplane without wings. It's not possible for a human being to be truly satisfied and at peace apart from a relationship with the God of the universe. He goes on, creatures are not made, not born with desires unless satisfaction for those desires exists. Let him explain, here's what he's saying. A baby feels hunger, right? Well, there is such a thing as food. A baby feels hungry because there is such a thing as food. A duckling wants to swim. Why? Because there is such a thing as water. Men feel sexual desire. Well, there is such a thing as sex. In other words, every desire has a corresponding reality. That's his point. Now watch this. If I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. For another kind of world. Another kind of experience as a human being. So what are you? What am I? What is a human being? A human being is, is a mental creature, yes, we all have minds, we think. A human being is an emotional creature, yes, we have feelings. A human being is a biological creature, right? We have bodies. We're mental, emotional, physical creatures, but we're something more. 
all of that mental, emotional, and biological composition is a single unit, a composite, that is made, designed, or engineered for thriving, beautiful relationships. There are people, there are people who need you. There are people that you need. There are relationships to develop. So I want to encourage you to do something. I want to encourage you, not here, not now, but in your private time, just get alone somewhere. Maybe tonight, back in your, in your what? I don't know, where are you staying here? I saw all kinds of tents. Are you staying in little tents somewhere? Oh, I'm so glad I'm in a hotel <laughs> with air conditioning. No food, but there's air conditioning. Okay. So when you get alone this evening, if you can get alone, I want to encourage you to do something. I just want you to write down, write down somewhere in your phone, on paper, if you still use paper. I want you to write down the names of five people that you want to build closer better, more intimate, friendly, positive relationships with. And then intentionally go about the process of making yourself available and building those relationships. Don't get creepy or weird. Don't become a stalker. Be very dignified about it. <laughs> But just think of five people, I don't know who they would be for you. I, I can tell you that if my mom was still alive, she would be on my list. I wish that I had spent more time in conversations with my mother. I can't do that because she's gone. Just the other day, Somebody I love very much, a very close friend, suddenly out of nowhere, he died in his sleep. And I said to myself, man, I wish I had spent more time with him. So write down some names and prioritize people. Prioritize relationships. Prioritize building positive relationships with people. Thank you for your time this afternoon. Okay, I'm not sure what the schedule is. They told me I have 90 minutes, but in my opinion, 90 minutes is way too long to talk. So I'm done. We have about 25 more minutes, and I'm just gonna hang out here. If anybody has any questions, you wanna visit, you wanna talk, you, whatever, I'm just gonna hang out and, and, and we can do that. Also, make sure, um, make sure that you take the 95 Theses. That's yours, it's a gift. I wanna encourage you to read them. Um, do not nail these on your church's door. They're just for you to read. <laughs> Definitely do not nail them on your pastor's chest. Just take them and read them. Okay, thank you and have a good afternoon and a good evening. And uh, if you wanna visit or anything, I'll be here.